People are obsessed with counting, ranking, and measuring. We count how many people there are in the world. We rank the best restaurants and hotels. We measure how much we weigh or how tall we are. We measure how fast people can run, how people can jump, how much money we make. We measure everything that can be measured and sometimes try to measure things that can't. In some cases, more is better, and in other cases, less is better. So why do we measure things? Measuring is a way to compare ourselves with others, to compare our country with other countries, to compare how things change over time. Essentially, measurement gives us useful information which allows us a better understanding of the world we live in and our place in that world. When we consider the economy, there are several important items that economists like to measure. How much output we produce, or what we call gross domestic product. How much national income we have how much unemployment there is, how much inflation there is. To make these measurements, economists con must construct units of measurement, much like we use inches to measure length or pounds to measure weight. These units of measurement must be well defined so that when we say inflation is 5%, everyone will understand what that means. Now, how are national output, national income, unemployment, and inflation measured? This is what we want to think about in the next two segments. What we're going to find is that while there are commonly agreed ways to measure these variables, the measurements are far from perfect. Understanding how these important economic variables are measured is essential for understanding how an economy works. Mm -hmm. Consider first a measure of how much output is produced by a nation. When we first speak of national output, we need to know what is included in that output. When we measure how many goods and services produced in an economy in a given year, well, what should we include? Now, while we find it useful to compare what we produce today with what we produced yesterday, we need a measure of output to know how much is a nation we are currently producing, not the accumulation of everything that's been produced in the past. But what output does a nation produce each year? A nation produces billions of items and provides as many goods and services. Any good or service that is produced in the current year is part of national output. Now, the first problem we encounter in measuring national output is how to add everything together. Let's illustrate this with a problem. If you have a small farm, you could say that this year you produce seven barrels of apples and ten baskets of corn your national output would be exactly that, seven barrels of apples and ten baskets of corn. However, suppose now you produce 1,000 different products. If someone were to ask you, what did you produce this year, they may have to wait the whole year just to find out how much you produced. Ten baskets of corn, three cases of tomatoes, five sacks of wheat, 20 bunches of bananas, and so on. Well, there must be an easier way, and in fact there is. We can simply value each good at its market price so that all of the output would be in dollar terms and then can be added together to get one number that measures output. For example, suppose you produce 10 bushels of apples which sold for $1.50 each, 6 sacks of wheat which sold for $1.20 each, and 20 pounds of fish which sold for $2 a pound. The market value of each is simply the quantity times the market price. Performing this calculation, you'd have an output of $62.20. Now, if someone were to ask you how much did you produce, you could simply say, I produced $62.20 worth of goods. Well, this certainly is a lot quicker. Indeed, this is approximately the same method used to compute a nation's output. The particular name given to a nation's output is called gross domestic product. Gross domestic product, or GDP as it's commonly called, is defined as the total value of all final goods and services produced within a given period of time by factors of production located within a country. Now you may wonder why the words final and located within were highlighted in our definition. 
This is because there are several aspects to measuring GDP that are not always obvious in simple examples, such as that of the fruit farmer, but are very important when we consider the complexity of the nation as a whole. First, consider the need for output to be final goods and services, opposed to what economists call intermediate goods and services. Intermediate goods and services are used in the production of another good, such as steel, used for the production of cars. The problem that arises if intermediate goods are also included in our count of a nation's output is that we end up double counting. Here's an example. Let's make some beer. Now to make beer, which is the final product, we use hops, yeast, malt, water, the services of a brewer, and the services of a retailer. All of these things are intermediate goods. Now here's a list of the market prices for each of these items. We've got two gallons of water at 25 cents a gallon, one pound of hops at five dollars a pound, one and a half cups of malt at 20 cents a cup, one tablespoon of yeast at 50 cents. A brewer purchases the ingredients for six dollars and thirty cents and goes into the brewery and makes the beer. The brewer then sells the beer to a retailer for $7.80. The retailer sells the beer to the public for $8.80, the final market price for the final good. Suppose we compute a GDP as the market value of all goods and services, including intermediate items. Adding up all of these goods would give us a GDP that's shown here. Now this may seem all right until we consider more carefully the final market value of the beer. Now why does the beer have a final price of $8.80? Because that price covers the cost of the ingredients, the services of the brewer, and the services of the retailer. Therefore, the final market price for the beer already includes the market value of the intermediate products, $6.30, plus the services of the brewer, which are $7.80, less the $6.30 of the ingredients, or $1.50, plus the services of the retailer, which are $8.80, less the wholesale price of the beer, $7.80, or $1. Now, if you were to include the intermediate items, you would be double counting. Double counting is avoided if we just add up the values of the final goods and services. In this example, GDP would just be the final price of the beer, or $8.80. Now there's another way to avoid double counting. This is to use what economists call the value added method. Value added is computed as the difference between the value of goods as they leave a stage of production and the cost of the goods as they enter the stage of production. Now let's go back to our brewing example. The brewer buys the ingredients and puts them together and sells the beer to a retailer for $7.80. The brewer, by transforming the $6.30 worth of ingredients into the brew, adds value of $1.50. The retailer, who purchases the beer for $7.80, takes it and displays it, adds value because consumers can easily buy it. They sell it for $8.80. The value added by the retailer is thus a dollar. If you sum up all of the value added, they are equal to the final market price. Therefore, GDP can be computed in two ways. We can sum together the market value of all final goods and services, or sum together the value added at each stage of production. Now, why would we want two different ways to compute GDP when one is enough? Well, the value-added approach gives us a clear idea of what goes on at each stage of production in terms of contribution to GDP. Now let's go back to measuring GDP, or how much a nation produces each time period. Remember that GDP is defined as the market value of all final goods and services produced within a given period of time by factors of production located within a country. We know that there's a distinction between final goods and intermediate goods, which avoids double counting. The next particular item that comes up when measuring GDP is the location of the factors of production. Now, what do we mean by factors of production? Factors of production are used to produce goods and services, and economists commonly refer to them as land, labor, and capital. Land refers to all natural resources, such as oil, coal, and water. 
Labor refers to all human resources, which includes not only the number of workers that a country has, but also the talents and educational level of those workers. Capital refers to all the equipment, machinery, and buildings that are used to produce output. When we measure GDP, these factors of production must be physically located within the borders of the United States. If we can look at a map of North America, U.S. GDP would consist of all the output of factories within its borders, regardless of who owns the factory. The factory could be owned by Canadians, Mexicans, or Japanese. It doesn't matter because if it's located within the U.S., then its output is part of our GDP. Similarly, if a U.S. firm relocates to Mexico or Canada, its output is not counted as part of the U.S. GDP because the factory is not located physically within the United States. There's another measure of a nation's output which does consider who owns the factors of production. This measure is called Gross National Product, or GNP, and is defined as the total market value of all goods and services produced within a given period by factors of production owned by a country's citizens, regardless of where the output is produced. Finally, one last point regarding our definition of GDP. GDP is supposed to measure how much output a nation produces in a given period of time, say one year. Therefore, transactions in which money or goods exchange hands, but nothing new is produced, are ignored. If you can purchase an old house or an old car, this transaction is not recorded in GDP because those items were produced a long time ago and not in the current period. If you purchase a new house or a new car that were produced in the current period, then these transactions are counted in GDP. The most important thing to remember is that GDP is measuring the amount of goods and services produced in the current period. So far, we've talked about GDP as a way to measure national output and have looked at very simple examples. However, now we're going to discover that when we measure GDP using what are called the National Income and Products Accounts, we're going to come up with a very simple framework of the economy that will allow us to begin to see how the macroeconomy works. Remember, the GDP measures the final market value of all goods and services. Well, one way of measuring GDP is to simply add up the amount of expenditures on all final output in the economy. However, if we want to understand how the economy works, we can look at the ways, systematically, how groups actually buy the final output. These groups have different sets of behavior, and changes in their behavior have an effect on GDP. So it's important to separate the expenditures between those of households, those of firms, those of the government, and those of the rest of the world. Suppose GDP in a given year is analogous to a big pie. The expenditure approach to GDP considers how much of the pie is allocated to each of these four groups. Households purchase final goods and services such as food, clothing, furniture, cars, and medical care. This is called personal consumption expenditures given by the letter C. These consumption expenditures can either be for durable goods, non-durable goods, and services. Durable goods are household items that last a long time, such as cars and washing machines. Non-durable goods are goods that are used up quickly, such as food and clothing. And services are activities we purchase that do not involve the production of a physical item. These services could be such things as childcare or education. The amount of expenditures on final goods and services households consume is usually around 68% of GDP. That's taking a big slice of the pie. The second group that purchases final goods and services are businesses. We call these expenditures investment, given by the symbol I. Investment by firms can either be for new plant and equipment, what economists call non-residential investment, or it can be on new housing or apartment buildings, what we call residential investment. Or it can be for new inventories, what economists call changes in business inventories. Gross private investment, denoted by the letter I, includes all three of these investment expenditures. So I is comprised of residential investment, non-residential investment, and changes in business inventories. Note that when economists speak of investment, they're not referring to financial investment in stocks or bonds, which is more of its common everyday use. The amount of investment expenditures in the economy hovers around 13% of GDP.
Let's look more carefully at components of investment and in particular non-residential investment and changes in business inventories. We'll first look at changes in business inventories. Now inventories are the goods a firm produces now and intends to sell later. Nearly all firms keep inventories in stock. At a grocery store, all of the food on the shelf is part of the store's inventories. Now, at any given time, there's a stock of inventory. A stock is just the amount of something at a given point in time. Now, inventories provide a very important service to the consumer. When you go into a store, inventories mean you have a wide selection of products available immediately. If the store carried no inventories, you wouldn't have such a wide selection. The change in business inventories is the amount of new inventory a firm purchases. It's a part of GDP because it's a purchase of some of the nation's final product. Notice that GDP is not total final sales, but the market value of total production. GDP is equal to total final sales plus changes in business inventories. Total final sales includes the purchase of almost all the output produced by a nation in a given time period. However, we need to add the part of the nation's output that's produced by firms but still sitting on the shelves. Recently, there's been some concern that other countries are buying up the capital stock of the United States. For example, Japanese firms have purchased factories, buildings, and retail stores in the U.S. Well, let's look at this a little more carefully. How much of the capital stock in the U.S. is owned by foreigners? Remember, buying and selling is a two-way street, so the U.S. also owns assets in other countries. Of all the capital stock in the U.S., which includes property, factory, machinery, how much is owned by foreigners? Would you say 50 percent, 25 percent, 5 percent? Well, in fact, in 1991, only about 2.5 percent of the fixed capital in the U.S. was owned by foreigners. Of that 2.5 percent, the biggest holder of U.S. assets was Great Britain, holding about 26 percent followed by Japan with about 21 percent and the Dutch holding 15.7 percent. Well now let's get back to our pie and look at the other groups that take a slice of GDP. We can't forget the government which includes both federal, state, and local government. The government purchases goods and services such as paper, bombs, buildings, computers, and the labor services of Congress. These purchases comprise about 19 percent of GDP. It's important to remember that when we speak of expenditures by the government with respect to GDP, they were speaking of expenditures on goods and services. The government also makes payments for Social Security, unemployment insurance, and welfare. These, however, are transfer payments and redistribute income but are not purchases of any goods or services newly produced. Finally, the rest of our GDP pie is sold to foreigners. U.S. goods and services sold to foreigners are called exports. The U.S. can also purchase goods and services from other countries, and those are called imports. The difference between exports and imports is called net exports. If net exports are positive, then the U.S. exports more than it imports, and we have a trade surplus. If net exports are negative, then the U.S. imports more than it exports, and we have a trade deficit. Before 1983, the U.S. generally ran a trade surplus. After 1983, the U.S. has been, had a chronic trade deficit. Now, why this has occurred is an interesting and important economic concern, and we'll also examine this later on in the course. In summary, using the expenditure approach to calculate GDP gives us the following important macroeconomic identity, which simply adds up the final spending on goods and services by important economic sectors, namely households, businesses, governments, and the rest of the world. One note regarding this equation. Why do we subtract out imports? Because expenditures on final goods and services by households, firms, and the government can be for both domestically produced goods and for foreign goods. Subtracting out imports avoids counting the production of goods by other countries as part of U.S. GDP. This identity will be very useful when we start to examine how GDP changes over time in response to changes in the behavior of households, firms, governments, and the rest of the world. Let's now think about comparing a nation's GDP over time. This discussion considers the difference between what economists call nominal GDP versus real GDP.
So far, we've measured GDP for a given year using current market prices. When any economic variable is measured in current prices, we say this variable is measured in nominal terms. Nominal GDP, then, is the current value of output valued in current market prices. Suppose now that we want to compare GDP over time. Let's look at a simple example to see what kind of problem may arise and how we can address this problem. Consider an economy that produces only one good. Let's call it good X. Nominal GDP for the first year is $5,000. Nominal GDP for the second year is also $5,000. If you were to only look at nominal GDP, what might you conclude? The numbers are the same, so you might think that national output is the same for both years. However, if you look at the prices and the quantities, clearly in the second year, national output has dropped from $500 to $250, and prices have doubled from $10 to $20. If we're concerned with comparing how much national output an economy produces over different time periods, then nominal GDP creates a problem. We're not able to tell if output has changed or prices have changed. Now, how can we get around this? Since we're concerned primarily with changes in the level of output when we measure GDP, let's fix or anchor prices so they can't change. Here we see real GDP for year one equal to $10 times 500 units, which is $5,000. And for year two, it's $10, which is the base year price, times 250, which is $2,500. Real GDP, then, is GDP measured in the base year price. We arbitrarily choose a base year for prices. In this example, we picked year one. These base year prices are then used to compute GDP for the other years. When GDP is computed for each year using a base year price, we call this real GDP. Looking at real GDP, it becomes clear that output declined from year one to year two. Real GDP allows us to focus on changes in the level of output as opposed to changes in the level of prices because prices are fixed in any given base year period. Any variations in real GDP reflect changes in output and not prices. Real GDP in the United States varies over time. When real GDP falls, it signifies that output has contracted. We call this a recession if real GDP declines for two straight quarters. When real GDP increases, output's expanding. Nominal GDP generally grows faster than real GDP because nominal GDP also includes increases in the level of prices over time. There's a nice relationship between real and nominal GDP that allows us to measure the price levels in an economy for any given year. This measure of the overall level of price in an economy is called the GDP deflator. The GDP deflator is equal to nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100. For a given year, the nominal GDP is equal to the current price times current output, and real GDP is equal to the base year price times current output. So for our example, for year one, the GDP deflator is equal to nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100, and that's equal to $10 times 500 divided by $10 times 500 times 100, or that's 100. In year two, the GDP deflator is equal to $20 times 250 divided by $10 times 250 times 100, and that's 200. In general, for this, good for this one good economy, the GDP deflator is equal to the current price times current output divided by base year price times current output times 100. The GDP deflator gives us levels of prices. Now, how fast prices are changing is the inflation rate, and it's computed as the percentage change in the price level from year to year. Be careful about distinguishing between levels and rates of change. A level is a given number, such as your height. How fast you grow is the rate of change. To compute a percentage change, use the following formula. The percent change in the variable x is equal to the change in x times 100. For the inflation rate, we compute the change in GDP divided by the GDP deflator times 100.
In our data, for example, the inflation rate for 1979 to 1980 is 85.7 minus 78.6 divided by 78.6 times 100, and that's 9.03 percent. The inflation rate tells us that from 1979 to 1980, the overall price level of prices rose at a rate of 9.03 percent. From 1983 to 1984, prices rose at a rate of 4.14 percent. Later, we'll consider other measures of inflation that look at particular baskets of goods, such as consumer goods or producer goods. The GDP deflator looks at prices of all goods produced in the economy. Earlier, we said we'd like to measure GDP to consider how well off we are as a nation in terms of how much output or income we have and to allow us to compare changes in our national output over time. Does the measure of GDP that we have developed give us an accurate assessment of our national welfare? While economists generally agree that GDP is a fairly good measure of national welfare, there are some systematic problems associated with this measure that we should be aware of. First, not everything that's counted in GDP is actually a good thing to have. Our measure of GDP does not make a distinction regarding the types of goods and services that are actually produced. No distinction is made between the production of pornography, pollution, and education. They all contribute to an increase in GDP. For example, when the Exxon Valdez spilled oil in the waters of northern Alaska, GDP increased because of the increased services associated with cleaning up the waters. Could we say that this increase actually made us better off as a nation? The environmental effects of increased production may actually make us worse off if we end up living in a country with degraded land, polluted air, and congested highways. GDP fails to take into account activities that are not performed in the market but contribute to national output. It's as if things not on the market have no value. For example, work done primarily by women in the home, such as cooking, cleaning, and child care activities, are not included in GDP, despite the fact that these activities do contribute to national well-being. GDP also doesn't count the underground economy, or activities which generate income but where the income is not reported. Illegal activities, such as drug dealing and participation in black markets, produce income, but this income is not reported to the tax authorities and therefore doesn't show up in GDP. In fact, one of the main reasons for the presence of an underground economy are attempts to evade taxes. Estimates of the underground economy in the U.S. range from 5% to 30% of GDP. This implies that GDP in the U.S. would be 5 to 30% higher than the reported figures in any given year. Department of Justice officials have promised further arrests as the crackdown on suspected subversives gathers momentum. Finally, GDP says nothing about the distribution of income or who is getting the national income produced in an economy. Suppose we have two economies, A and B, and assume that both have the same level of GDP, say $100,000. In country A, $99,000 could go to one person and $1,000 to the remaining people. In country B, the income could be divided equally among the population. GDP would not tell us which country actually generates more welfare for its population. All of these problems may lead to difficulties in using GDP as a single measure of a country's well-being. However, most economists consider it to be a reasonable measure of the economic health of an economy.